morning. Welcome to Daily Devotion. I'm Pastor Krieger. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Our devotion today is from Acts chapter 2, um, Peter's sermon uh, on Pentecost. So when, when Peter was standing in front of the crowd on Pentecost Sunday, we see the reason for all of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, all the times he showed his hands and his side, uh, he let... He let his disciples feel and touch. Uh, he ate and drank with them. It was because it wasn't just for those who saw. These people, they were to be his witnesses. Uh, charged, they were charged with going out and spreading the good news that Jesus was alive, that everything that had happened, just like he said it, said it would, that all of his words had been proven to be true also. And the assurance that they gave from that point on was, we have seen it with our own eyes. And they were witnesses not just to people of that generation, but also to us. We have these words recorded as an accurate reporting of what happened and what was said at the time when there were plenty of people around who could have spoken out against it if it weren't true. So I'm going to read to you a portion uh, of Peter's Pentecost sermon. He was speaking with people who had completely lost touch with God's Old Testament promises to send a Messiah, uh, a Messiah who would suffer and die to pay for the, their sins. So over time, uh, their focus had had been shifted uh, by, um, it had been shifted to, to trust instead in their own obedience, both to God's law and to uh, made up human laws that they, had, that they had created to prove their piety. Uh, Peter crushes all these false hopes. He calls on them to turn away from their sin, and he offers them a far better hope. Uh, So this is uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 41. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other, uh, the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of the Lord. In verse 38, um, you see this this, uh, very first occurrence of of the name Jesus Christ. The first time that Jesus' Jesus' name was combined with this official title, Jesus. Christ later became a very common usage to call him Jesus Christ. Then he says, he says, repent, repent in the name of Jesus Christ and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now in Matthew 28, Jesus said to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here it says uh, only in the name of Jesus Christ. And well, so which is it? Does it matter? And of course, people argue about this. Um, And I'll just point out that even though Both of these phrases sound the same in English. Uh, They're actually two different Greek prepositions. So in in Matthew, it very clearly says to be baptized in the uh, the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, And here, uh, if we want very literal, it would have to end up being something very clunky. It would say something like, be baptized, every one of you, upon the basis of of the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And so here in Peter's sermon, he's not telling us the words to say. He's talking about what baptism is based on. It means to be baptized in connection with what Jesus has revealed about himself. Baptism seals us with his name, and it gives us everything his name and promises contain. Uh, But then, obviously, sometimes the question comes up, well, what if you're not baptized? What if you love Jesus, but you don't want to be baptized? 
And I will concede that this is a question that I'm not aware of ever being addressed directly in the Bible. And the reason for that is it's kind of an odd question. Um, if I said to you, I want to give you a house uh, as a gift for free, and you were overjoyed at my, my generosity and you're excited to take possession of it and, and to move in and to joy, enjoy all the benefits of living in a house, uh, and in the process of, of giving it to you, I offered you the deed, and you said, oh, no, 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 no thanks, I don't want that. Well, then I would sort of be forced to conclude one of two things. Uh, maybe you just don't understand how this whole thing works, or, or maybe I would have to ask, well, do you want the house or not? So what Jesus offers in baptism is bigger and greater and more generous than, than the gift of some earthly dwelling place because no matter how big or luxurious or beautiful a house is, it can only last as long as the earth lasts. It means it's temporary. And you can only enjoy it as long as you live, uh, which means that your enjoyment is probably even shorter than that, right? So Jesus is offering something for eternity. He offers the benefit of his righteous life and his sacrificial death, and he says, this is how I'm going to give it to you. It's through the word, connected with the water, and it's sort of a strange thing to even ask, well, what if I want the gift, but I want you to give it to me in a different way? Now, I don't know if that illustration answers every question or, or what if scenario we could come up with, like what if someone comes to faith and doesn't have time. Well, that that's not a normal occurrence. Um, the, the promise is, is through the word. Um, so that's sort of separate from the question of, well, what if I don't want it that way, right? Uh, the, the gist of the whole thing is this. Baptism is a gift. And if the questions that arise in us from hearing about this gift are treating it more like baptism is, is an obligation, I think that it's a strong possibility that we're missing the point. God does something for us in baptism, we do nothing for him. Our acceptance of baptism is only an acceptance of God's gift. These words of Peter really can't be understood any other way. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. It's for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there are a whole lot of people who will not let these words mean what they plainly mean. If, a, if baptism is only a symbol of my inner conviction, well then, how is it for the forgiveness of sins? If, if this gift of the Holy Spirit is a reward, the, that this gift of the Holy Spirit that Peter mentions, if he's talking about it as a reward for willingly undergoing this ceremony as a symbol of my commitment, then that's not a gift. That's not what gift means. It's wages. It's payment for services rendered. It's, it's a two-sided deal. God, I, I'll do this thing for you, and then you'll do something good for me. But if that's the case, then the, the Bible's consistent message that salvation is only by grace to us is completely contradicted and undone. Now, I, and I didn't read Peter's whole sermon to you, but if you go back uh, to Acts 2 and, and read it, you'll see who it is that he's speaking to. He accuses these people of being responsible, personally responsible, for putting Jesus to death by nailing him to the cross. And yet these are the intended recipients of this gift, won by Jesus' innocent death. What are you going to call that? That's nothing but grace. Grace, uh, grace for people who are guilty. And instead of bringing them judgment, he brings them forgiveness. And Peter said, this promise is for you and, and your children and all who are far off. And who's that far off? That's even us. And how does God do it? See how, do you see how he restores our, our hope in him and builds us up in faith by bringing us constantly back to his promises, not back to his instructions? His promises are true for us today. They're true for us forever. All this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.